John Riardi, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. It's a huge pleasure and honor that you invited me on. You know, as we were talking about before we started, I have been following the website and the podcast for an embarrassingly long period of time, actually. And and yeah, I mean, it was even your site that gave me a lot of motivation and inspiration early on for what we're doing at Precision Nutrition. The idea that you could just love great content and use that as a vehicle to start a business like, hey, we're not writing this content for any other reason than to put out fantastic content into the world. And and so you were doing this almost before anyone else. And it was like a huge inspiration for us to actually do the same. And, and so thank you for that. And thanks for all the great stuff over the years. Well, thanks for the kind words. It's, it's very humbling and, and, and I'm honored. Thanks so much. So we're going to talk about intermittent fasting today. Talk about your background first. You're a PhD, but a PhD in what? Yeah, so I, uh, I have a PhD in exercise and nutritional biochemistry. My, my route to, to what I do today is kind of non-conventional. I was, you know, I, I guess probably the story begins most appropriately when I was a very scrawny high school student or very scrawny growing up in general with asthma and allergies and my puffer everywhere that I went. So I wasn't an athletic kid or anything like that. And But, you know, identifying very much with the old Charles Atlas sand kicked in the face by the bully ads. You know, I saved up my dishwashing money when I was 16 and bought a barbell set from Sears. And that sort of, (laughs) that's where the passion for working out and strength training came from. And I, you know, over the next couple of years, I think two, two and a half years, I put on about 70 pounds of muscle, went on to compete in some bodybuilding and powerlifting competitions. And the discipline that I learned in, in bodybuilding and, and powerlifting, you know, the the nutrition, the, the regular workouts and stuff really changed my life. And, and then I decided to you know, go to community college eventually and get a good enough grades to go to university. So then I, I did a pre-med undergrad thinking I was going to go to med school. And then I realized that I just don't think I like any of that. You know, I, I love learning about the body, but I really love exercise and nutrition. So then I did a master's in exercise physiology and then a, a, a PhD in exercise and nutritional biochemistry. But, you know, that route kind of grooms you for academics, right, to be a professor or a researcher. And I did that for a few years, but uh, my heart just always kept coming back to coaching. So, you know, uh, throughout those years of of academics and and research, I was on the side, you know, working with athletes and and recreational exercisers who wanted to look and feel better. And at at a certain point, I was just like, you know what, let, let me just do this, probably very much like what you did with your website. This is the thing that I think about every moment. I'm not thinking about the other things I'm, people think I'm supposed to think about. So I'm going to write about it and publish about it. So, you know, over the years, that's how Precision Nutrition was born with just free articles on the internet. And thankfully to date, it's, it's grown tremendously. And, and uh, you know, now we have a legit business. And, and, you know, since we started over the last 15 years, we've coached, you know, over 50,000 people online and we also have a certification program. So, you know, I often like to say, you know, when I talk about nutrition, that yes, I have sort of an academic pedigree, but it's it's not the most important part of, of what I do or my experience. I, I think the most important part is having worked with about 50,000 people and having the experience of taking what you might read about in research studies or on the internet and applying it and actually seeing what works and then having your whole livelihood based on uh, paring down all the experiments to the fundamentals that actually do work in the end. So you actually wrote an article for us in 2012. It's like almost five years ago, which I can't believe it's time goes by so fast about intermittent fasting. Before we get into what intermittent, well, we, we all know what intermittent fasting is. Fasting is going without food. Intermittent fasting is you know, doing that on a sort of regular basis. But why have you spent a lot of time researching and experimenting with intermittent fasting? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I mean, I have this weird thing where my profession is also my hobby and passion and all consuming interest. So, you know, I, I coach a lot of people and I teach other professionals, you know, our system for doing that through certifications and, and, and software and things like that. But, you know, I mean, I'm just forever interested in physique manipulation, health, body composition, performance. 
you know, I'm in my mid forties now. I compete in master's level tracks. I'm always experimenting with things on myself and, you know, I, I have academic training and I have a lot of coaching experience. So I feel like I can do that successfully without too much risk. And, you know, there was, there was a point several years back where I decided that after years and years of, of weightlifting and, and, you know, sort of bodybuilding and, and also powerlifting training, I wanted to make a triumphant return to sport, you know, like competitive sport. And I was a, a runner, a, a sprinter, a track and field athlete when I was younger. And so I, um, you know, I was like, oh, I heard about these master's level track meets. Wouldn't it be cool if I could, you know, in my 40s run track again? So the problem was I was just too muscular. And I know this is one of these like humble brags, you know, I was too muscle, you know, muscle bound to run. But I, I went too much, you know, to be fast. And, and also I hadn't done mobility work that would be crop that would be required or the drills in years. And so I wanted to lose some weight. And right around the same time, and this was like, you know, 2010, 2011, there was a lot, a lot, a lot of noise on the internet about intermittent fasting. And, and nowadays we take for granted this particular truth that we've learned. But back then, the whole paradigm around food and, and nutrition was you have to eat small meals frequently throughout the day for health. And you probably remember this. It was what everyone was talking about. And all of a sudden, this sort of radical band of intermittent fasters were telling people, no, 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 it won't kill your metabolism. It won't ruin your health if you uh, went for long stretches without eating in between your meals, whether that's a full day of a fast periodically, whether that's just an extended fast each day. So you eat, maybe skip breakfast. And so you have lunch and dinner. And during those times, you make thoughtful choices so you can get all of your nutritional needs. And at the time, it caused a huge rift. It's very much like what's happening now around, should we eat meat or, or no meat and just plants? You know, with some of the documentaries that have come out recently, it was the same thing. Everyone was just all frothed up about a different issue. And it was, you know, should you eat frequently small meals or this fasting thing? And, um, you know, when you work in nutrition, there's about, oh, a million messages a day you get about this kind of a thing. And you get these really heated, irrational debates. And, you know, being a trained scientist, uh, it, it's sort of my mental makeup, and I consider it also my vocation to actually take a non-emotional approach to these things and just test them, whether that's experimentation with small groups of our coaching clients, because we have so many every year that we could do small pilot uh, projects, research projects, comparing two groups on two different types of diets. And we've done that before, or also just on myself and some of the people who work at Precision Nutrition or some of my friends and colleagues. So I was just really fascinated. And it, the timing came perfect because this big debate was up. I was wondering what all the hype was about. And I also wanted to lose about 20 pounds for track and field. So I decided I would try a whole bunch of different intermittent fasting type interventions in my life and document everything to see how it would turn out. So that was kind of the genesis of the experiment. It was part professional curiosity, part personal goal setting, and then also, you know, part just a deep interest in this particular emotional debate of the day. Like what would happen? You know, unlike the debate today around whether you whether meats are causing cancer and we should all eat plant-based or whatever, which will take 30 years to resolve. The intermittent fasting thing you could figure out, at least in terms of body composition and blood markers, pretty quickly in like 12 or 16 weeks, you try it, you measure stuff carefully and you see what turns out. So it was a perfect kind of short-term experiment at the time. So yeah, as you said, there's a lot of, there was a lot of hype and there still is a lot of hype and a lot of t you know talk on the web about intermittent fasting. What are some of the touted benefits that, you, that you've seen out there you know, attributed to intermittent fasting? Yeah, I mean, some of the benefits are, I mean, it, I, I like to break things down into different categories. So we could, we could say there are sort of body composition benefits, we could say there are uh, proposed health benefits, and then we can say there are proposed psychological benefits. So if we look at sort of the body composition benefits, well, people say that you can lose a, a lot of body fat without tra the traditional pain of dieting. You know, historically, when people went on a diet, if they, in particular, if they were active and, and let's say they went to a gym and they hired a personal trainer or a diet coach or whatever, th they would get that message, small meals eaten frequently throughout the day, maybe cut out carbohydrates. And it's pretty restrictive and it's pretty 
challenging, difficult, mentally, emotionally, even physiologically, workouts start to suffer and, and stuff like that. And uh, so, you know, a lot of people are proposing with intermittent fasting, you don't have to deprive yourself so much, really, if you're doing, let's say, uh, an extended fast, which some people call sort of 16-8 fasting, where you have 16 hours of the day where you don't eat meals, and eight, during an eight-hour window, you do. During those eight hours, you, you can't eat indiscriminately, but there's a lot more latitude in your choices because you've gone through this extended fasting period. So that's one of the proposed benefits. It's an easier way to lose body fat if you can get past the initial phase of really being hungry in the morning at breakfast, you know, body comp benefits. Then there's proposed health benefits, which are better regulation of blood sugar, lower blood lipids, and a whole host of other things associated with the things we might be able to measure with a blood test. And, you know, things from lowering insulin and lowering inflammation and stuff like that. And, and some of that does bear out in the literature, just not quite the way that people on the internet are saying. And then the third are the psychological benefits. Now, for a lot of people, hunger is an emergency. It's like when it's time to eat, if you don't eat, you have this sort of preloaded notion that it's an emergency. And if you don't get food, bad things are going to happen. Like you're going to get hypoglycemic or you're going to get really irritable. Some people call it hangry, like hunger and anger mixed. And I think that's part psychological, but it's also part physiology. It's that you are so trained not to have periods of hunger in your life that you get a maladapted type of response when you don't eat. And one of the sort of proposed benefits, and I saw this personally with doing intermittent fasting, is that you learn that hunger isn't an emergency. You can actually go quite a long period of time without food and be very serene about it if two things happen. One, you know that it's okay, it's not an emergency. And two, you train your body to be what is called uh, metabolically flexible. So for people who are used to eating frequently throughout the day, or even just breakfast, lunch, and dinner, um, what tends to happen is there's a hormone uh, or neurotransmitter slash hormone called ghrelin, and it's an anticipatory hormone. It's a hormone that is released about 30 minutes before your habitual meal time. So if you always eat lunch at 1230, it's going to start coming around 1130 or 12. And it's what makes your stomach start to grumble. It's what starts to make you feel hungry before there's even food around. It's your body saying, oh, yeah, I, I know uh, Brett eats usually around 1230. So uh, let's start getting ready now. Ghrelin's trainable, which means if you change your meal time after about 14 days, it'll start being released at the 30 minutes prior to the new meal time. So what tends to happen with intermittent fasting is you start to manipulate ghrelin and make it a bit more flexible. And then you also make your body's use of fuel more flexible. So people who, let's say, have a hard time losing body fat in some cases aren't usually well adapted at using whatever fuels available whenever it's available, including the fuel that's already stored on your body. So, you know, unless you're 2% body fat, you have lots of meals stored on you right now. So you don't need breakfast to feed your body the energy that's required. It should just be able to use the meals that are on you, all that stored energy that you have through you know, glycogen, through body fat, even through your free amino acid pool, which is the uh, breakdown products of protein. So you should be able to eat the meals that are on you. The problem is if you're not used to going through little periods of, of a longer fast, your body may have a hard time eating the food that's on you. It may not release the correct balance of hormones in the right amounts so that you can easily use that fuel. And one thing that intermittent fasting does is it trains you to be more metabolically flexible. In other words, if you have to skip lunch and dinner one day for whatever reason, your body will just easily eat the meals that's on itself without feeling aggravated and angry and hypoglycemic or whatever the feelings that people describe that they may have. So really people break it down in three buckets in terms of potential benefits. One is a body composition one, perhaps lose fat more easily. Two is a health one, perhaps fix a bunch of blood markers for health. And then three is a, a physiological, psychological one, or at least where the two interface, right? Making you more easily able to use the fuel that's on you if you're not eating a meal and also making you 
I guess, less of a jerk when you don't need a meal. Let's break this down a little bit. Let's talk about these uh, the health benefits, these blood marker benefits. I, I see a lot of about this, and um, it, you see these studies fairly done on, they're usually done on animals, mice, and you're like, yeah, intermittent fasting can kill cancer, or intermittent fasting can increase longevity and like make you live longer. Is there any credence to these research? Like, Will people get those benefits, or should they kind of look at it with a bit of healthy skepticism? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the latter, you know, with nutrition and physiology and biology and health, it is to everyone's advantage to assume that the truth is way more nuanced than anything you read, than even the experts of the day know. If you go into any biological discussion thinking it should be settled or cut and dry or someone on the earth knows the answer to it, you would be wrong. <laughs> the truth is, especially when it comes to nutrition, we did an infographic for our website called uh, Why Nutrition Science is So Confusing. And what we did is we compared the nutrition, I guess the history of nutritional science to the history of chemistry. And really like chemi- the history of chemistry started being chronicled like thousands of years BC. Okay. And for the first several hundred years, it was still in the alchemy phase, right? So, so they were trying to change metals, you know, and nutrition as a science really began in the late 1800s. So if we want to liken it to chemistry, chemistry's had thousands and thousands of years to learn stuff. And it still obviously doesn't know everything. Nutrition is still in the alchemy days, right? We are still in the phase where chemistry had tried to start and had not begun with anything relevant or useful yet. And I, I mean, I, I'm being a little bit facetious here, but the truth is nutrition science is so young. So if anyone tells you they know, uh, they probably don't. And it takes a, a much more nuanced view. So if we look at your question in a very nuanced way, you know, does intermittent fasting have the potential to like treat and cure cancer? Uh, well, uh, that seems non-nuanced to me. A uh, nuance there is uh, in rodent models, which we know aren't identical to human models, certain types of intermittent fasting may do a couple of things. With a particular type of tumor, it may actually produce a, a small regression. Or, and, and what's been shown way more often, is that when treating cancer, whether it's radiation or chemotherapy, the animals can tolerate a higher dose without side effects, which in many cases is really useful, right? Because the higher dose may be required to shrink the tumor mass. So we see, again, it's subtle things like that. Now, what ends up happening? Well, what ends up happening is people go on the internet and say, hey, look, intermittent fasting cures cancer. And no, but, uh, but I mean, there, there's all this intriguing data now, the, the fun thing is when, when I wrote our original book, you know, Experiments with Intermittent Fasting, which I think is what got us on your radar to do the article on your site. Um, we, you know, I said in the next five to seven years, the research will really hit its stride and we'll really figure out what intermittent fasting is doing. Well, as you reminded me in a scary way, like it was five years ago since I wrote that, I wrote the book and we did the article on your site. And uh, the research hasn't yet hit its stride. We don't know a lot more now than we did then. So, I mean, again, in the book, we sort of review some of the research, but there's, there's a little data to suggest favorable improvements in certain blood markers and, you know, some of these cancer outcomes that we saw. But the notion that intermittent fasting is, a, is sort of this panacea or a cure-all is, is very false. Um, and, you know, as much as it benefited me, you know, and, and you saw the results of my experiments and stuff, I, I don't actually do it anymore. There's a whole group of people that we coach that we actively dissuade from trying it until a certain point in their own sort of health and fitness journey. And in women, we're very, very careful because of a whole host of things, how intermittent fasting may affect a female body differently than a male body. So I think with everything else, there, there needs to be some nuance and there needs to be some understanding of these sort of conditional if then statements. Oh, if you want to try intermittent fasting and you're a woman, then something. If you're, uh, if you want to try intermittent fasting and you're a man, then it may be something different. If you want to try intermittent fasting and you're a man who is young and single with a robust and flexible metabolism, 
it may be one thing. If you want to try intermittent fasting and you're a man who is middle-aged, who doesn't exercise, who doesn't have a flexible metabolism and has a stressful life, it may be something totally different. And I think, and that's how I think through things. It's, it's really sort of a conditional type of way. If this and this, then what? And the then is different. It's not, if you want to try intermittent fasting, try it because it's good, because that is a false statement. Right. So there's a lot to break down there and we will, I want to get to some of those things, especially how intermittent fasting affects men and women differently. But okay, talking about these, going back to these blood markers, uh, you know, one of the benefits is it's supposed to help regulate insulin, uh, regulate blood sugar. I mean, what's the research say about that? What effect does it have on other hormones like testosterone? I think you've written about that. Can you talk, dig a little deeper into that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was part of my, as you recall, my sort of experimentation, you know, it wasn't just how do I feel and, and, and body comp, you know, again, I, I spent a ridiculously long time in, in university uh, learning to be a scientist. So, you know, we did photos and we did measures and we did strength measures and all that, but we also did a whole host of, you know, body composition or sorry, blood work analyses. And we even did psychological and psychometric profiles. Cause I want to see, you know, a lot of people talked about intermittent fasting being very good for attention and psychological focus. And, and what I found was, it was for a very specific type of task, but for other tasks, it made it worse, right? So again, that's where their subtlety and nuance comes in. Not all attention is the same. But back to your question, you know, the, the notion that something like intermittent fasting could help regulate blood sugar, it has a, has a solid basis. You know, the idea being that if you aren't feeding yourself regularly, you know, external food, breakfast, lunch, dinner, whatever, and you're going periods of time without feeding yourself food, your body has to upregulate receptors, which are these little sort of docking stations on every cell that receive the chemical message of a hormone, for example, to tell the cell what to do. It upregulates some of those. It upregulates the uh, production of certain hormones. So, you know, most people have heard of adrenaline or epinephrine and norepinephrine. Well, when, when we do an extended fast, epinephrine and norepinephrine are upregulated. These are what we're, are often called our fight or flight hormones. But what they also do is help to release body fat, stored carbohydrates from their storage depots so that they can actually make you know, circulating nutrients and also fuel cells. So one of the ways that intermittent fasting may help with regulation of blood sugar is that you're obviously not taking an external sugar. So your body finds a way, it trains itself, it becomes metabolically flexible to release only the amount of energy from storage that's required at any point in time and no additional, which means that it finds a way to regulate its own stuff pretty well in most cases. Now this takes time. And again, it's not a panacea. Generally when people start intermittent fasting and they're not very metabolically flexible, Uh, The first two weeks are a disaster. They're hungry and they're irritable. Their ghrelin hasn't adapted yet. So like, I can't skip breakfast. I'm just a breakfast person. Well, that's not true. It just takes two weeks for you to realize whether you are or not. And generally, people aren't breakfast or not breakfast people. They can be trained to be either. Likewise, your ability to become more metabolically flexible doesn't change with one or two days. It takes a period of time. So, you know, again, regulating insulin. Yeah, it it actually does a pretty good job of that. Although some of the markers of insulin in in my own work, my own experiments, didn't markedly change because I was already kind of healthy. So again, the if then statements come up, right? If you're already healthy and you switch to intermittent fasting, you may see no changes in blood markers at all. If you are overweight and your blood markers are a mess, any intervention would probably improve that. Intermittent fasting is one of the ones that could testosterone and and anabolic hormones. Well, they, you know, there's mixed data on those. So again, it depends on the person and it's another set of if then statements, but you know, in some cases you'll see the anabolic hormones, the muscle building hormones go down testosterone, free testosterone, insulin, like growth factor, a growth hormone. Uh, Some of these things may chronically go down, but acutely increase like growth hormone, for example, goes up pretty markedly during a fast. But chronically, in in other words, measured when those sort of daily increases and decreases are balanced out over time, there may be no effect to total growth hormone load, although testosterone and and IGF-1 might go down. 
a uh, cortisol, which is a catabolic hormone, tends to go up. So really, you know, if you're not a, a physiologist or, you know, have expertise in endocrinology, it's fine. Uh, generally, the hormones can be lumped into catabolic and anabolic hormones. And the catabolic ones are things like epinephrine, norepinephrine, and cortisol. The anabolic ones are like IGF-1 and testosterone. With intermittent fasting, generally the catabolic hormones or the breakdown hormones go up, which is what you want if you, if you want to lose fat to some extent. Uh, and the anabolic ones go down. Now, it's not the same for everyone. And again, there's subtlety and nuance here, but that's what you can expect both logically and physiologically. In other words, when you look in the research. Okay. <clears throat> Let's go back. So I have a question. This is a personal one. Maybe it'll help other people figure something out too. Whenever I do intermittent fasting, I always think, well, I haven't had any food. So like my blood, like carbohydrate, especially my blood sugar should be like below 100, right? Right. But like whenever I fast, like it's always above 100, It'd be like 110, 111, like what and is you just use a glucometer regularly yeah. to, to monitor that? Yeah, yeah. So I just use it, you know, the diabetes. No, that's like the, pretty hardcore, isn't it? Like how do you how'd you get into doing Well it's that? not a glucometer, it's just like the uh, you know, the diabetes test thing, right? Yeah. I I don't know. I was I was interested in it and so I decided to yeah. buy one. Um because I was well, there was a time when I was trying to do ketosis. Right. And right, I was, right. you know, doing the keto strips and then I was also just wanting to check my blood sugar on it as well. And yeah, so I started testing, but I've just, I've done that experiment on myself. Whenever I intermittent fast or even go low carb or no carb, my blood sugar spikes, which you you think is like so counterintuitive to me. It's like, well, I haven't had carbohydrates, so it shouldn't spike. I know this is the amazing beauty of the, of the human body and physiology, right? Like we think we're being so clever to outsmart our fat cells and our endocrinology, but there's so many redundant systems to prevent us from doing anything too stupid. <laughs> you know, for example, blood, uh, a regulated balanced blood sugar is absolutely essential to life, regardless of what keto people will tell you or whatever. And, and they tell you, oh yeah, blood glucose or glucose isn't the best source of fuel. It's ketone bodies and the brain likes those best and blah, blah, blah. But right. ah, that's, that's very debatable. In other words, just look at what you're talking about there. You don't eat any carbohydrates and your body finds a way to create enough blood glucose to keep glucose stable and keep you alive. Thank you, body. <laughs> you know, um, no, we can't outsmart you. So in, in this case, it's a perfect example of those catabolic hormones in action. What you're talking about here, you know, you are eating low to no carbohydrates or you're fasting. So this is like literally no food is coming in externally but somehow your body is producing glucose from your liver. Well, I mean that, or other sources. That is a product of what we talked about. Epinephrine goes up, norepinephrine goes up. Cortisol goes up, the catabolic hormones. Their function is to release stored energy. So your stored energy is being released and bam, goes into your bloodstream and it goes to the cells as required. So it's, it's really, really, uh, you know, a known physiological thing. Again, without like a ton of, a biology or endocrinology training, it seems super weird. Incidentally, this is also the reason why people often say, let's say with intermittent fasting, well, I feel more energetic. I feel like I have more energy and sometimes focus. Well, the, the reason is that's what epinephrine does, right? Imagine the fight or flight scenario kicking in. What is supposed to happen if you're being chased by a bear or startled or scared? You're supposed to get super hyper-focused and energetic to get away from the threat. That is why it has nothing to do with carbohydrates and insulin, blah, blah, blah. It has everything to do with the release of epinephrine, the fight or flight hormone that is released when you do an extended fast or when you don't feed your body any carbohydrates and are in an energy deficit. It's the exact thing that's keeping you alive or, or providing energy or helping you eat the meals that are on you that's making you feel this particular kind of energy and also increasing your blood sugar. Okay, so let's go back to the body composition. So you were able to lose a lot of body fat mm -hmm. do, using intermittent fasting. What is it about intermittent fasting that allowed you to do that? Is it a combination? Is there something special about intermittent fasting or is it in the end just sort of when you intermittent fast, you end up eating fewer calories than you usually do? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, that's a great debate that I don't think is resolved, but it may not matter really. You know, the truth is when you do intermittent fasting, you generally will eat fewer calories. 
The other thing, I, I, not just because you are not eating one meal a day or, you know, if you're fasting one day a week, an entire day of no eating, but also because generally people don't make decisions like this in a vacuum. They don't, they don't make it a science experiment. They're not like, oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to try intermittent fasting, but I'm going to actually figure out how many calories I was eating on average before intermittent fasting and then exactly match the number of calories while intermittent fasting as I was before intermittent fasting to see if it's the fasting or the caloric load. And I'm going to keep caloric load constant, right? No one's doing that. When you decide to try a health intervention, it makes a whole bunch of other decisions for you too. You start doing intermittent fasting and also you start being more mindful about your food and you start making better food choices. And that generally leads to a lower caloric intake. So it's not only the actual effect of skipping a meal or a whole day of meals. It's the knock-on effect of making a whole bunch of other changes because you're now mindful of this and you've made it a project in your life. So, I mean, that's generally what's happening. People are eating fewer calories than they otherwise would have. Now, is there some other magic physiology at place? Like, is it that growth hormone spike or that epinephrine nor epinephrine? Maybe, that may be part of it. Or it may be 50-50 or maybe 75-25. We don't know. Research, I don't know if it will ever resolve this, like ever, ever, you know? It, it may take 2,000 years. But again, it probably doesn't matter. Uh, my gut feeling, uh, you know, as a scientist and as someone who's practiced this and tried it in a lot of people, is that it's a combination. You know, one, it, you tend to eat less because you're not eating certain windows. Two, you tend to eat better choices, which means fewer calories because you're choosing better things. Three, there's some hormonal and physiological things happening that are slightly different. So it's probably a combination of the three. But the, if I were to say the biggest factor, it's probably the energy deficit and the mindfulness to your health and your nutrition that makes the biggest uh, impact. Okay. And the, another question, I've I, when I've done intermittent fasting is... I'll see results pretty quickly, mm -hmm. but then eventually I don't see them anymore. So are mm -hmm. the effects of intermittent fasting acute or chronic? Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. I think it's highly individual, you know, very much like whether a low carb diet or a moderate carb diet is better also has a lot to do with how you exercise and, and what your training looks like. You know, it, it's really interesting because the co-founder of Precision Nutrition, the guy who started the company with me, I had been doing intermittent fasting for a while for this experiment and for my own body change. And it, it was going uh, really, really well. I mean, I lost about 20 pounds over, you know, 16 weeks. I tried a whole bunch of different protocols. I felt like I plateaued towards the end simply because I got too lean. Like if, if anyone's interested, you can go look at the, the pictures. I mean, you know, I, I did a, um, ultrasound type body fat testing technology. So it may not be perfect, but it's pretty good. And it was reading me at like 4% body fat. So I didn't have a lot more to lose. And um, generally when you tend to get that lean, a whole bunch of mechanisms kick in to keep you alive. They're like, Hey dummy, we're getting in the danger zone. So uh, appetite gets dramatically upregulated. A whole bunch of neurotransmitters and hormones are released to make you less active. So even though I could show up at the gym the same number of days a week or at the track, in between workouts, my body is like, hey, you should stay on this couch a little bit longer. You know, so you, the, the activities of daily life go down and we see it over and over and over again in research. When your energy balance gets too negative or you get too lean, your body finds a way to slow you down and conserve energy. And you can be like, no, no, but I'm still working out the same. That's not what I'm talking about here. Your workouts generally only account for about 30% of your metabolic rate each day. The other 70 is your activities of daily life and your body finds a way to slow you down. It finds a way to consume or sorry, expend less energy. So for me, that's where the plateau happened. It happened at the absolute edge of leanness. My business partner, Phil though, right around the time I was at my leanest, you know, we, we were away together. He was getting ready to get married. So we were away in Italy for his bachelor party, his bachelor trip. And he was like, holy crap, dude, I've never seen you in this good of shape. Like what's, what's going on? So I told him about it and he's like, cool, I'm going to try that for my wedding. Right. So I remember, uh, you know, his wedding came up very shortly thereafter and he got in great shape doing this, just like you said, 
short period of time, he lost like 15 pounds, looked great in his tux, whatever. And then literally, like I didn't see him for a few weeks because he went on the honeymoon and we work in a virtual company. So we only see each other basically from the neck up in virtual meetings. And then the next time I saw him was like a month later and he had totally gained all the weight back. And I was like, oh, you know, hey, how's the intermittent fasting going? And he's like, "Uh, easy come, easy go, buddy. (laughs) Like the minute I stopped intermittent fasting, it was like the weight just came right back on. And so, I mean, it just points out one of the dangers of these sort of kind of what what I consider very quick fixy type of implementations of eating plans, right? Where you're like, yeah, intermittent fasting will shred like 10 pounds really fast. I mean, you just essentially cut out, you know, if you eat three meals a day, you cut out one third of your intake, right? Yeah, of course. But will you sustain that for the rest of your life? If not, but the day you decide to start eating breakfast again, without any sort of commensurate changes, it's, it's going to come right back just as quickly. So it's a, it's a really important thing to consider. So let's talk about, you referred to early, something earlier that intermittent fasting is very individual, right? It's, it, a lot, there's a lot of if-then conditionals going on there. How does, so you mentioned men and women, there's a difference there. How do men and women respond differently to intermittent fasting? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, uh, obviously different individuals are different sort of genetically lifestyle wise, et cetera. But generally when we look at all women's physiological and nutritional exercise research, women are exquisitely sensitive to low carbohydrates and energy imbalances. So in other words, when they get into a negative energy balance, so however it happens, they are burning more calories than they ingest in a day. And whenever they go too low carb for too long, their whole sensing mechanism, hypothalamus, pituitary, these these glands that sit at the base of your brain, right? Which are sort of the master command centers for all hormones and physiological activity. They sense what's happening and then they send out messages to the rest of the cells to tell them what to do. And those messages are hormones. They're exquisitely sensitive to energy imbalance and to low carbohydrate intakes Generally, I mean, it, you know, the physiological or evolutionary explanation is to preserve body fat and reproductive health, right? Because men are very, uh, they're of very little importance to the reproductive equation. Uh, women are fundamentally important because not only do they have to have a healthy reproductive system to get pregnant, but they also have to have a healthy hormonal system to sustain a pregnancy and deliver healthy offspring into the world. So this is the evolutionary explanation for why this happens, but it doesn't really matter. It just happens when women do too much intermittent fasting, they see all kinds of, you know, hypothalamic amenorrhea. So they, they lose their menstrual cycling and that's, you know, that's just, that's the external symptom. But what's really happening is a massive depression of reproductive hormones, a massive change in neurotransmitter output, and for all kinds of problems down the line, everything from reduced bone mass to thyroid hormone health to the ability to lose body fat or have a healthy balance of muscle to fat, all these things go really haywire in women. And it, it happens much more easily than men. And it happens much more readily when they do longer term low carb diets and even intermittent fasting. Now there's loads of women who may be listening to this. They post on our forums and, and they send us emails all the time. We're like, you're wrong, Dr. Barati. I've been doing this and I'm fine, right? And then, you know, obviously there's always going to be outliers. We hear from them, but also we have to look at the time course. I'm not saying it happens in a week or even three weeks or even three months, but over time, this, this can happen. I've seen it happen over a year or two years. So people who are saying, no, that's not true. That's not me. And I've done it. Like I have personal experience. They may not just be far along yet or far enough along uh, to actually see the downstream consequences. So that's the male female difference. You know, generally I found that really fascinating, fascinating when I was following the intermittent fasting conversation, because most of the very vocal advocates of intermittent fasting on the internet, because you don't find a lot of them in the research world or whatever, because it's not settled yet there. So you find them on the internet, telling stories, writing articles, being on forums and, and on Facebook. And most of the most vocal advocates are young, single dudes, 
totally makes sense, right? They don't have female physiology and young single dudes tend not to have partners and kids and demanding careers yet. And so uh, generally their overall stress load is much lower. And that is a very good set of circumstances for intermittent fasting. Overall stress low, because intermittent fasting is itself a stressor. It's probably one of the reasons it's beneficial because it is a stressor, but thrown onto a very stressful lifestyle. And this is one of the reasons why I stopped doing it. You know, I, my wife and I, we have four children now. I have this company, Precision Nutrition, with 100 team members. Yeah, intermittent fasting was just another stressor I did not need. And after a while, it became very difficult to sustain. Uh, like I said, it helped with a certain kind of concentration, but made other things much worse, like interacting with my team and interacting with our children. I find that when you're intermittent fasting, your focus on single solo like writing tasks and things like that is very good single-minded sort of tunnel vision kind of tasks. But if you have to collaborate, solve problems with a team, um, I don't know, parent, teach patiently your children, really, really difficult. So, you know, again, there's a couple of the if-thens. You know, if you're a woman, you have to be really careful with this. Probably don't do it on your own. If you're going to do it, have a coach. And make sure that coach knows what they're doing and make sure that you guys have an escape plan like a safe word for when it's time to stop the intermittent fasting because things are going wrong. If you're a man, consider your other lifestyle stressors and what's important in your life. Young single dude, yeah, give it a try. You're probably going to be fine. Middle-aged dude with a lot of work and family responsibilities, eh, this may not be so good for you, you know, uh, because the reasons I said. So those are some of the conditionals. Gotcha. Well, let's go, let's add in another conditional. All right, so you, if you're young, single, Go to go. If you're middle aged, got family, kids, stressful job, maybe not. But what about the type of training you do? Does intermittent fasting work better for different types of training? So, like, let's. I know intermittent fasting is really popular amongst long distance runners, particularly the low carb stuff. Mm -hmm. They're they're all about okay, you're aerobic, you want to burn fat instead of carbs, and intermittent fasting is a tool for that. Is is there any credence to that idea? You know, I think uh, this is one of the most heated debates because the entire history of sport nutrition is really founded on endurance exercise. You know, I mean, the, the field, I often joke, the field of, of sports science was founded when there was like a little extra space in a real physiology lab and someone stuck a treadmill in it. And they're like, we can do muscle biopsies and measure glycogen and people can run on that thing until they get exhausted. That's actually, and that was like the first 20 years of sports science and, and sports nutrition in particular, measure the amount of glycogen in a muscle by chopping a chunk of muscle out, do it in runners who can run on that treadmill because treadmill doesn't take up a lot of space in the lab. And so, but, but the history of sports nutrition actually bears out that, well, I don't know, this whole modern idea of athletes doing best on low carb diets you're just hearing the outliers, you know, now I'm not saying it's false. What I'm saying is there's nuance here too. For example, if you are the type of person who could train on a lower carb diet to get a whole host of physiological adaptations that, that are beneficial, but then leading up to an event can load your glycogen high, you're probably in the minority, but it's a cool minority to be in because you might see some interesting benefits, but not everyone's in that group. So yeah, I think we have to be really careful. There's a lot of loud voices on the internet that take up too much of the mind share around this. Most of the elite endurance athletes do not follow low carbohydrate diets. But with that said, we'll get to the broader point you were trying to make, which is exercise. Does exercise influence this? And the answer is yes. I mean, there's obviously people who don't exercise at all. And the question is, is intermittent fasting for them? I think the answer is whether they exercise, if they don't exercise, there's a, another criterion that's more important, which is how much nutritional experience do they have? You know, when we coach people, and again, there's a lot of them every year and we see all different levels. You know, we work with you know, 20 different professional sports teams right now, all the way down to non-exercisers who are interested in just losing weight, you know, maybe three, 400 pounds. And so for people without much nutritional experience, we never, never start them at intermittent fasting. It's probably a recipe for a whole host of weird food beliefs and possibly even disordered eating. Uh, sometimes you just need reps or practice. 
and making healthy eating choices at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So that's where we begin. So if someone is, is not really mindful about what they eat, the first thing is get mindful about what you eat and practice. Just like if you're learning to play the guitar or language, you've got to put in reps every day or, or else you never get good at it. So it's breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Let's get the reps rather than let's just chop out a whole meal and teach you a whole different skill set that probably isn't that beneficial to you in the long term. So if someone does an exercise, we rarely ever start them at intermittent fasting unless they have a lot of nutrition experience and they make good food choices already. Then it's an option, but there's probably 10 others we could go with. If someone does exercise, it depends on the volume and intensity. Elite athletes probably shouldn't do intermittent fasting as a regular practice throughout the entire training year. They could do it during low volume periods of training when body composition is really important, like they have to lose body fat. But as a way to enhance performance, I would say like 9.5 times out of 10, no, it won't enhance performance. The only reason I would ever give it to an elite athlete is if they have body composition management to do. And I would never do it during their heavy training periods of the year because just more stress on top of more stress plus heavy training periods are for physiological adaptation to make you either stronger, faster, or have a better aerobic system. And this isn't going to support that. So that's, that's kind of how I break it down. So now we've done the two ends of the spectrum. We've done dozen exercise and elite athlete. Now let's go into the middle. Someone who goes to the gym three, four times a week does strength training. You know, like you and I were talking, if you get really into barbell training or something like that, the way that it, I think there's a particular type of intermittent fasting that may be effective for that if you want to try it. And that's the 16, eight style where on your non-training days, when you do actually eat, you just eat, you know, protein, vegetables, you know, very moderate or even low carbohydrate. And then on your training days, after you train very high carbohydrate, that I found to be very, very effective if someone is going to do this. Again, recreational exerciser on training days, a lot of calories during your eating window and a lot of carbs. And on your non-training days, keep the carbs really low and moderate your calories. That I think could be very effective because generally recreational exercisers want to see some performance benefits, but generally it's about this fine balance between you know, doing well in the gym and getting a little bit better and also looking good naked, right? And that's what intermittent fasting can actually help with quite a bit, looking good naked. Again, though, there's a whole bunch of other ways to look good naked, you know, through more mindful choices, through very specific manipulations and macronutrients and calories. So it's, it's one choice. So, you know, start to see I, I'm a very sort of systems-based thinker. So a flow chart kind of comes out of this. You're like, if doesn't exercise, no nutrition experience, probably not intermittent fasting. If doesn't exercise, some nutrition experience, maybe intermittent fasting. If elite athlete, no under all conditions except has to lose body fat and in a low volume training period. If recreational exerciser wants to look good naked and, and have small increases in strength over time, um, yes, it's one of a few options for doing that. Right. I love that. Um, yeah, I, I, my, I used to intermittent fast regularly um, a few years ago. And this was, I was, I had an eating window from 12 p.m. until 7 p.m. But then I, yeah. I stopped because I got really into barbell training. And I just noticed that my progress, it, I just, I, I plateaued. And you know, I tried changing the programming. That didn't do anything. So I was like, okay, it's the diet. Mm -hmm. um, and I was also doing low carb at the time, which I found, come to find out, that's not good if you want to get stronger. Mm -hmm. um, because strength is like a very intense, it's very anaerobic. So you need carbohydrates. And I also, I did, I got my, my genetic, did my genetic testing. And what I found out was I actually do better on a um, lower fat, higher carbohydrate diet. That's right. Which I, that's another kind of conditional put in there. Like everyone, these, these guys that, you know, purport, you know, that really promote high fat, low carb, um, you know, intermittent fasting, like it probably works for them because their body is geared towards that. Mm -hmm. And so they, they, then they sort of universalize that and generalize and say, this is for everybody. Well, that might not be the case. Yeah, it's, it's true. And you know, there's also this other factor. We often say it's, it's what works for you 
for now under the conditions that your life is in now, right? Because the notion that somehow as a young person, like we talked about, let's say young dude with few stressors and responsibilities, that a particular diet that works for you now will be the same diet that works for you in 30 years if you get married, have children, have a aggressive career. We have to take into account that that may be false. So there's, there is the genetics, there's the lifestyle piece and it all plays together. And usually the most vocal proponents are people pretty new in their journey, right? I mean, this isn't just with nutrition, it's with every other evangelism there is, right? Uh, you're like, I found this thing. It's amazing. I'm feeling good on it, whatever it is, belief in a particular theory, a religion or a nutrition system. And it's people very early in their journey who are the loudest about it. And they seem so convincing, right? But, you know, the, the, that ignores the for now. It worked for you for now. It may not work for you for later. Uh, we did a, a great piece on a, a physician who's a good friend of mine who uh, was a big low-carb advocate for years, and we called it Carb Confessions. You know, it's the story of a low-carb convert. So for years, he's a big proponent of, of low-carb eating, and then uh, someone convinced him to do a little experiment, very much like you. He's very in, into strength training. And he just added some carbs and like all these things improved his blood work, his strength, all this. And he was just like, it was a, a very difficult realization for him because he was like, wow, I'm like, how could I have been so locked into this one way of thinking for so long? And it, it's, it's very easy to explain but it's very difficult when you're living it, right? So, so, so that's really it. You know, the, our whole philosophy at, at Precision Nutrition is being nutritionally agnostic. In other words, being open to every and all nutritional possibilities that could help a person at a different stage in their lives. So there's, there's a particular kind of person who over the course of their life might need to do a paleo style diet for a while and a low carb for a while and an intermittent fasting for a while and then a high carb for a while and then maybe a vegan diet for a while. And all those possibilities are okay. You know, it's our belief that um, there are principles that live like at a higher level than the macronutrient split of a diet. You know, because you and I both know vegans who are very healthy, lift weights, strong, have a great blood profile, and also people who eat lots of meat and very little vegetables in the same exact situation, healthy, strong, lean, whatever. So neither of those camps can be totally right. If vegans are like, no, the meat eaters are unhealthy and what fat, whatever, and the uh, paleo people say the same about vegans, uh, the evidence of just experience has to tell you that's not true. There are people who are healthy in both camps. So it must not be the macronutrient breakdown or the absence or presence of meat that is the differentiator. Both camps must share something in common that transcends what they're fighting over that helps them both be healthy, lean, and strong. And that's what we set out to find and help people achieve in whatever way fits into their lives. And, and I think that's really a key take home message for the nutrition dialogue nowadays. I love that. Yeah. People can get very ideological when it comes to food. I, I, my wife and I joke like food's the new religion. Mm -hmm, totally. Right? Like people are less religious, but like we are religious about our food mm -hmm. or our workouts. Right? And that analogy extends, like you could come up with 50 different examples of that. I, I, I believe it. It's true. It, it, it is treated very much that way. And people organize into tribes and they fight over belief systems and, and you know, the, prevailing pressure is to come up with one true, you know, nutrition belief, one true God, whatever it is. Right. So yeah, I, I very much agree. It, it's become that way, at least in the subcultures that think a lot about this. Yeah. So we've been talking a lot about the nuanced benefits of fasting and the, the downsides of fasting, because there are some, we haven't talked about like just fasting protocols. You mentioned one, which was, I think it was 16, eight, is what you said. So it's 16 hours of fasting, eight hours feeding window. So what would that look like for somebody like in a typical day? Yeah. I mean, the, the ones that I tried in, in my experimentation that, that we logged and recorded, one was a, a, just a once, once a week fast where every Sunday I just wouldn't eat any food. So I'd eat my last meal Saturday evening around 10 PM. And then I would either fast until Monday morning. So it's kind of like a day and a half 
or I would have a meal at 10 p.m. on Sunday. So it's just 24 hours without eating. And I know some listeners are probably shuddering to think about that, like, oh, my God, won't you die? And the answer is no. <laughs> you know, the first few times it is very challenging, though. You know, I'll, I'll give you that because of a whole host of expectations our body has about feeding. But that, that's what I started with. And, and for people who are interested in, let's say, the health benefits of fasting, it's the one I actually recommend they start with because it's very controlled. Like if you do the 16-8 thing, which we'll talk about in a second, you have to commit to kind of doing it often, right? This, you only have to commit to it, let's say once a month or once every three months, or, you know, I eventually got to once a week, but, um, but that was one of the protocols. Uh, the, the most research protocol, and I think this is the worst idea for active people, is called every other day fasting. So literally you will only eat every other day this is the one that's been shown to have the most, let's say, longevity benefits, possible health benefits. But I think this the, that's a function of very much like calorie restriction, just radically reducing your calorie intake. And that's okay if you're inactive. I'm not sure it's the best way to get healthy. But if you're active, it's a nightmare. It's terrible for performance in the long run. I also I also think it, there's a social downside too, right? Because oh, like absolutely. most of our socializing revolves around food. Absolutely, right? I mean, uh, there was a point, you know, when I did my experiments, we had only only two of our four children, where like I was literally not eating meals with my family. You know what I mean? It's, well, daddy's on a different plan, you know, and I mean that was just with my family. And then you know, like when you talk about outside the house social experiences. Yeah, I mean, I you might as well, wear, well wore a T-shirt that said, said, like, I have weird nutrition beliefs. You know what I mean? And, yeah, so, so there is a social downside. You know, the 16-8 protocol, you know, is, is gener- generally, it can be constructed in a host of different ways. But the way most people talk about it is, like you did, from about noon till 7 or 8 p.m. is your eating window. And then the rest of the time you just don't eat. And functionally, what that looks like is you have lunch and dinner. And now for really performance or, or let's say, strength training oriented people, what they would try to do is have a strength training session at the end of their fast, right? So do that at like 11 or 11.30 or 12. So if like, let's say I work from home, so I have the luxury of working out when I want. But if you don't, you might work out over your lunch break. And then you have a big lunch and then you have a dinner and then you just don't eat again until the next day after your workout. And so it's pretty straightforward. And, you know, the idea is to be still mindful about your choices, eat lots of veggies, eat, you know, a required amount of protein. You know, again, if like, I, I don't believe that the average strength trainer who isn't over fat should be on a low carb diet all the time. So you get loads of carbs in after strength training on those days. And then maybe, like I said, on the non-strength training days, you cut the carbs back a little, not to zero, but a little bit, you know, that, that pretty effectively is the protocol. So it's a little bit of intermittent fasting and a little bit of carbohydrate cycling and a little bit of meal timing. So this one is sort of has a a little bit more complexity to it. And and it's the one I saw the best results with uh, personally, but again, I mean, I'm not doing it anymore. So that there's, there's a certain testimony to that there. You know, I often say when people ask me for nutritional supplement advice, which supplement should I take? Well, one of the first things you want to know is, you know, what does the person that you're asking take? Now, your goals may be different. Your physiology may be different, but you want to know at least that the person that you're asking for advice eats their own dog food to begin with, you know? And so I, thought intermittent fasting was cool. It was a cool thing to experiment with, but I didn't want to do it in the long run because there were other options for eating well and being healthy and being fit that didn't involve, you know, skipping meals every day, having this long period of time without meals. And also the side effects of that, which for me was I would become sort of pretty irritable towards the end of the fast. I wasn't able to share meals with my family regularly. So the similar costs were too great, but generally those are the three big ones. You know, the maybe once a week or once a month, do a fast. And that one is very easy to discount. Like, oh yeah, you just skip meals on a Sunday once a month. What could that possibly do? But there's, there's some data suggesting that it could actually help improve metabolic flexibility pretty effectively. Just that one fast, you know, training your body one time a month 
to eat its own meals may actually last for the whole month until the next one. So I wouldn't discount that one. Then there's doing that a bit more regularly. I also tried fasting like two times a week versus every other day or just once. And that really put a dent in my performance. Then again, there's a 16A. And some people even take it further. There's a, there's a protocol some people have called the warrior diet, which is a bit more nuanced, but generally it's one meal a day. So you just have one big meal to account for all of your calorie needs. And then the rest of your day is a fast. Some people swear by it. I think it's probably too difficult to get enough nutrition in that one meal if you're highly active. But again, these are, these are the protocols that at least have a lot of attention right now. And, and there's probably not too much else. I mean, we're, we're just talking about a particular theme here. Do you eat one meal a day, two meals a day, or three meals a day? The longer you extend the fast, the more of the fasting benefits you might get, although there eventually comes a bit of a trade-off with being able to get enough energy and actually feeling good about your life and your day. Yeah. I mean, is there a time frame? Like you have to hit this time frame if you want to get the benefits of a fast, like, could you fast for eight hours and get benefits or do you have to like, you know, it's like, is there a minimum effective dose is what I'm asking. Yeah. No, no one really knows. I mean, one, some people use the, the growth hormone response as a marker, right? So growth hormone is a, is a hormone that's released in times of a bit of a negative energy balance or even stress. So we'll sort of use this growth hormone sort of cortisol kind of release as a marker. So they say, well, after eight hours, growth hormone and cortisol are still kind of normal, you know, or at least within a physiologically normally expected range. At 12 hours, they start to jump. At 16 hours, they're pretty high. At 24 to 36 hours, they're like, it's like you're actually doing performance enhancing drugs. So if you look at those markers, generally 12 to 16 hours, that shows a good spike. So, you, I mean, you could use that as a surrogate. It's very crude. But, yeah, I mean, you know, for if you want to get the benefits of fasting, somewhere in the 12 to 16 hours mark is probably good. I had a friend who did a, a kind of a different protocol. He would have only breakfast and dinners. So every day he would get about two 12-hour fasts, right? So he would get his overnight fast from 8 p.m. dinner to 8 in the morning breakfast. And then the 12 hours from breakfast to dinner. And he seemed to enjoy that and feel good. And it fit his lifestyle well because he worked in a high stress workplace and didn't like to stop for lunch. So he had a big breakfast and a big dinner and that was okay for him. So I think it's, it's really tempting to look for the magic formula, right? You're like, it has to be a certain number of hours. It has to be this way. I mean, I get emails from people all the time. They're like, I'm doing the fast and I have coffee in the morning. Does that break the fast? Well, no, there's no calories in it. What if I put one teaspoon of almond milk in? Does that break the fast? You know, they start to get at these weird kind of um, clarifications that probably are losing sight of the forest for the trees. You know, it, no, you're not fasting if you have some calories during that time. But have the benefits gone from high to zero? Absolutely not. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, um, in my experience, so I, I used to do the sort of the eight sixteen thing. Mm -hmm. I no longer do that. I only fast, I fast on Sundays. So I'll, you know, most Sundays I'll do a fast from Saturday night, my dinner to 12 o'clock on Sunday. And then once a month I'll do like a full 24 hour fast. And that's kind of my thing now. That's what mm -hmm. I do. And during the rest of the week I eat, you know, from breakfast until dinner. Yeah. And I, I still do that the same that you're talking about periodically. I do it randomly. But periodically, and, and for me, the one thing I found that's interesting, and if you're interested in body comp and health, then you'll be like, ah, whatever, what is this guy talking about now? But the one thing that I found that, that's interesting about it is uh, while there may be a small physiological benefit in terms of retaining metabolic flexibility from doing that every once in a while, I, I find some other things happen in, in, in my mind and, and personally for me. Uh, one is it's kind of cool to not eat all day on that day, like to not even think about my meals, to have to cook meals for myself or clean up after myself. I still have to do it for my family. I'm not fasting my three-year-old, you know, but that's kind of cool. Two is it's a little bit of a test of my, I don't know, discipline and strength because at points during that day, as I suspect you feel as well, you get hungry and it's very comfortable to just go have a snack, but to actually sustain yourself during that uncomfortable feeling and not give into it feels like a test of my discipline and strength 
And I like to do that periodically. And then the third thing is it is a very strong reminder for me, and this may not be important to other people, about what a privilege food and eating is for me. You know, there, there are lots of people who are food insecure in our own countries, you know, U.S. and Canada and elsewhere around the world who don't have the choice whether they eat or not. They don't get to make this decision. And so it, it kind of reminds me of that. And I, and I find that helpful just as, as a human being. Yeah. I mean, those, that's why I fast. Not so much for the health benefits, more of just an exercise and discipline and willpower. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, it kind of reminds me of the cold shower thing. I don't know. Have you ever gotten into doing yeah. that? No, yeah, I do cold showers regularly. Uh, sure. yeah, absolutely. It's that for me. And, and, and one of the guys who works at Precision Nutrition is a good friend of mine who's a former special operator in the Navy. He and I have talked about this a lot. And where we've both concluded is, are there physiological benefits? Maybe. Are they overstated? Absolutely. What's the biggest benefit I get out of doing it once in a while? It's a practice of being comfortable with discomfort. The people give business advice all the time. You have to lean into your discomfort. If you're uncomfortable, you got to do it. But how often, but that's just like people wagging their finger and proselytizing over how you should live your life, right? When do you get practiced at doing uncomfortable things? Well, there's, there's psychologically uncomfortable things. There's, you know, work things related to that. But cold showers are the most concrete example of that. Like it sucks to stand in freezing cold water. It never stops sucking, you know? But if you can find a way to step into freezing cold water, not tense your body up, to breathe through it, to actually have an inner dialogue that says something like, this is what cold water feels like. Not, I have to get out of this. This is an emergency. And it's one, and I bring this up because it relates to one of the interesting things with intermittent fasting, obviously. It's that hunger, and we started the call with this, hunger is not an emergency generally, right? It's just a thing you've trained yourself to think is an emergency. Very much like when you jump into cold water, all of your instincts tell you, jump out, this is horrible. But you can actually change a narrative and say, this, is, this isn't horrible, it's what cold water feels like. Oh, okay. Well, if I can sustain this, I can probably do other challenging things in my life. So I think both of these things actually speak to that in some way. And and I think a lot of people try and glorify the physiological benefits when a lot of the benefits actually come from this. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, John, this has been a great conversation. Where can people go to learn more about your work? Yeah. I mean, uh, just if they pop over to precisionnutrition.com, that's where, that's where we do all of our stuff. And like I said, very much like your site, you know, which was an early model for ours, you know, we've just been publishing free, very well-researched, comprehensive nutrition, fitness, health articles for a very long time. I think we have over a thousand free articles on the site. You don't have to give your name and email address or anything. Just They're just there for people to learn more from. So, you know, for everyone listening in, I, I thank you for spending all this time with us today. Hopefully you learned something. And uh, if you're interested or passionate about health and fitness, come check us out at precisionnutrition.com. Awesome. John Berardi, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Brett. My guest today is John Berardi. He is the co-owner of Precision Nutrition. It's an online nutrition coaching company. You can find out more information about his work at precisionnutrition.com. And if you're looking specifically for that ebook on intermittent fasting, go to precisionnutrition.com slash intermittent dash fasting. You can download it. It is free. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash fasting, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic. 